Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive with us. This time we're looking at something that I think a lot of our listeners are going to be familiar with, and that is the impact of childhood trauma on autistic individuals. But we're going a little bit deeper than just, you know, acknowledging that trauma exists. We're going to try to really understand how trauma shapes different personality responses in autistic people. We found a really fascinating blog post that we're going to be looking at today from Cheap ABA called Understanding Five Autistic Childhood Trauma Personalities. And I know what you're thinking, like, oh, great, another list of personality types. But I think what's really interesting about this deep dive is we're going to go beyond just labeling those personalities. We're going to get into, like, the why behind these behaviors. Um, and I think that's where things get really fascinating. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think the real takeaway here is that when we understand how these personalities develop as a response to trauma, we can then use that knowledge to actually provide effective support to people. So you can imagine, you know, if we misunderstand these personalities as just behavioral issues, then we might end up implementing interventions that really don't work or could even be harmful. That's such a good point. And the blog post really drove that home for me. It's like, you know, if you see a child who's constantly on edge, always scanning for danger, you know, as if something bad's about to happen, maybe like our first instinct is to try to discipline that anxiety away. But if we understand that that hypervigilance is actually a deeply ingrained response to some kind of past trauma, like, wow, that completely changes the way that we approach that child, right? Absolutely. Instead of seeing like a problem that needs to be fixed, we start to see you know, a kid who's actually adapted to survive yeah. in a world that felt really unsafe for them. And so suddenly, you know, discipline makes way for understanding and, you know, correction turns into support. And I think that's really the power of, you know, this kind of knowledge. I love that. Yeah. So let's dive into the first personality type that the blog post talks about, which is the hypervigilant protector. So these are the kids who are you know, like perpetually braced for impact. They're constantly scanning for threats. It's like their nervous system is stuck in this like high alert mode. Right. And it makes sense when you think about how trauma affects the brain. So imagine like a child who's experienced unpredictable or even dangerous situations. Their nervous system learns to just be on guard all the time, 24 seven. And that's essentially what the hypervigilant protector is. You know, they're always prepared for kind of the worst to happen. And we have to remember that, you know, this experience is amplified even more for autistic individuals. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, for folks who are autistic, even everyday sensory input can feel overwhelming, you know, especially if they have sensory processing differences. So imagine that feeling of always being on, but even more intense. That's a lot to deal with. For sure. It is. And, you know, the long term consequences of that constant anxiety can be really significant. It can impact their mental health, their relationships, you know, overall well-being. Yeah. But the good news is there are things that we can do to help. That's great. So what can we do? Like, how do we create a more supportive environment for these kids? I'm thinking like predictability and routine could be key. Yeah, absolutely. When the environment feels safe and predictable and familiar, that can really help to calm down that hypervigilant nervous system. And we can teach them, you know, coping mechanisms like, you know, things like deep breathing exercises or mindfulness that can help them to manage those overwhelming feelings. It's really all about giving them the tools to start to regain a sense of control in their lives. That makes so much sense. And, you know, I think it highlights how crucial it is to approach these personalities from a place of empathy and understanding rather than, you know, seeing them as difficult or problem behaviors. Right. Exactly. And I think that leads us into our next personality type which is the withdrawn observer. So this is a child who might seem really quiet. They might seem almost detached, mm -hmm. you know, preferring to kind of watch and listen rather than actively engaging. But, you know, their silence doesn't mean that they're not feeling things very deeply. Yeah, they've almost learned to protect themselves by kind of fading to the background a little bit, becoming like this silent observer of the world around them. Yeah. And for some, you know, that withdrawal might be a way to process their overwhelming emotions at their own pace without feeling that pressure to kind of conform to social expectations, which can be really difficult. You know, the blog post mentioned that they might express their feelings through art or through writing rather than words. I thought that was really interesting. Like, it's a good reminder that communication isn't always verbal, you know, especially for autistic individuals who may have challenges with traditional communication. Right. For those children, Art and writing can be really powerful outlets for emotions that are just too complex or too painful to put into words. Mm -hmm. It's like offering them a different language, you know, mm -hmm. a different way to connect and share their world. Totally. It's almost like saying, hey, we see you, we hear you, even in the silence, which I think is so important because I think sometimes our instinct can be to push those kids to be more outgoing, but that can really backfire, can it? 
Absolutely. Supporting the withdrawn observer means meeting them where they are, respecting their need for space and for observation, and gently encouraging connection without overwhelming them. That makes sense. So that brings us to a personality type that I think a lot of folks might find a little bit more challenging, and that's the angry reactor. So the blog post really emphasizes the intensity of their emotional outbursts, and it's easy to see how that could be difficult for people to navigate. Yeah, I think it's understandable that those intense reactions, you know, mm -hmm. especially when they seem to come out of nowhere, they can be kind of jarring. Mm. But the thing is, anger is often a secondary emotion. It's a mask. It's like a signal that there's something much deeper going on. Oh, so it's not about just labeling them as an angry kid. We have to like dig a little deeper and ask what's the source of that pain? What are the unmet needs that might be driving those outbursts? Exactly. When we start to view these reactions through a trauma-informed lens, mm -hmm. we begin to see them not as defiance, but as a form of communication. Like they're saying, help me. I don't know how to say this any other way. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. So then how do we support a child who's, you know, struggling to express their needs in a healthier way? Well, I think the first and most important thing is to create a really safe and non-judgmental space for them. Hmm. You know, a space where they actually feel heard and understood. And then we can start to teach them emotional regulation skills. Things like recognizing their triggers, identifying, you know, the physical sensations of anger, and then coming up with some calming strategies. So it's about giving them the tools to manage those emotions, not necessarily suppress them. I love that, yeah. So that brings us to our next personality type, which is the compliant chameleon. This is the child who prioritizes everyone else's needs above their own. They're constantly trying to fit in and please others. Yeah, you know, they've become masters of adaptation, mm -hmm. blending in, trying to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. And while that might seem like a really positive trait, it can actually have some serious consequences. Oh, for sure. Because if you're constantly molding yourself to fit other people's expectations, you can kind of lose sight of your own needs and your own desires. And then ultimately, you might end up with a really diminished sense of self. Exactly. And imagine the buildup of resentment. The feeling of constantly being unheard and unseen, you know, can really lead to burnout and potentially even exploitation. Wow. So then how do we help them break free from this pattern of accommodation? Well, we start by empowering them to recognize their own worth and to advocate for their needs, teaching them assertiveness skills, mm -hmm. you know, helping them set healthy boundaries, encouraging them to express their thoughts and feelings openly. It's like saying it's okay to say no. It's okay to prioritize your well-being. It's okay to embrace your individuality. I love that. Yeah. It's like giving them permission to be themselves without this pressure to constantly please others. So that brings us to our final personality type that this blog post talks about. And that's the resilient warrior. So this is the child who, despite facing significant challenges, they actually show remarkable strength and determination. Yeah. They actively seek health, use coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. and they just show this incredible will to overcome adversity. They're really inspiring. They really are. You know, it's so inspiring to witness their resilience. They really embody this idea that even in the face of trauma, growth and healing are possible. For sure. But, you know, their resilience doesn't mean that they're not impacted by trauma. Yeah. You know, even the strongest warriors face challenges and need support. Oh, absolutely. We can't let their outward strength blind us to what they might be struggling with internally. You know, they might still experience anxiety or flashbacks or, you know, be triggered by different things. Right. It's about recognizing that resilience isn't like a fixed state. It's an ongoing journey. And these individuals still need access to support. You yeah. know, they need therapeutic support. They need coping strategies. Mm -hmm. And they need a safe and compassionate environment where they can process those experiences and continue to heal. It's like we're seeing this, like, powerful combination of vulnerability and strength all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it reminds us that, you know, resilience doesn't mean that there's no struggle. It means that you have the ability to keep going and to keep fighting for that healing and well-being. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, as we kind of reflect on these five personality types, it's important to remember that, you know, they're not like rigid categories. They're much more fluid responses that are really shaped by each individual's experiences. And, you know, while this blog post offers a really valuable starting point, it's really just one piece of the puzzle. Right, because no two autistic people are the same. Like mm. their experiences with trauma are unique and the ways that they learn to cope and adapt are going to be just as diverse. Absolutely. And that's why we have to move beyond, you know, just labels and diagnoses mm -hmm. and really focus on understanding that individual person, you know, yeah. the child behind the behavior. 
I love that. It's about seeing the human being who deserves empathy and compassion and support, regardless of how their trauma might manifest. And it kind of makes me wonder, you know, how can we as a society create a more trauma-informed environment that really recognizes and supports all of the different ways that autistic individuals respond to, you know, adversity and difficult situations? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question. And it's a question that demands that we kind of look beyond just individual responses. Mm -hmm. And we start to consider the systemic factors that might be contributing to that trauma in the first place. You know, how can we create environments that are truly safe and supportive and affirming for autistic people? so that we can reduce that risk of trauma and really, you know, foster resilience from the start. Right. It's almost like we need like a paradigm shift, like moving away from just reacting to trauma after it happens and instead like proactively trying to prevent it by really understanding those unique vulnerabilities and challenges that autistic individuals face. For sure. And a crucial part of that is recognizing that, uh -huh. you know, it might be a minor stressor for one person can be completely overwhelming for someone else, yeah. especially someone with sensory sensitivities or social communication differences. Absolutely. It's about building a world where neurodiversity is not just tolerated, but like truly valued. A world where autistic individuals feel seen and heard and understood from a young age. Right. Imagine a world where you know their differences are celebrated, not pathologized where they're given the tools and the support they need to really thrive, right. rather than being forced to conform to neurotypical expectations. I love that vision. And it makes me think about, you know, how often we as a society try to fit square pegs into round holes, you know, instead of embracing the uniqueness of each individual. And I think that can be so damaging, especially for kids who are already trying to navigate a world that doesn't always make sense. Well, absolutely. And that's why it's so important that we amplify the voices of autistic people themselves. Mm -hmm. This blog post we're talking about, while insightful, yeah. it's just one perspective. And to truly understand, you know, we need to listen to those diverse experiences and perspectives within that community. Right. There's no one size fits all approach to understanding autism or trauma. Each person has their own story, their own way of processing and responding to the world. Yeah. And so while these five personality types yeah. you know, provide a really valuable framework, they should never be used to stereotype or to box individuals in. Right. It's about approaching each person with curiosity, with empathy, with a willingness to listen and learn without any preconceived notions or assumptions. And as we continue this conversation, I encourage you to reflect on, you know, your own experiences and your own assumptions. What biases might you hold, you know, consciously or unconsciously? How can you challenge those biases and become a more informed and compassionate ally? Such a good point. You know, it's a good reminder that creating a more trauma-informed society, it's not just about changing policies or changing systems. It's about really changing hearts and minds. It's about fostering a culture of empathy, understanding, and respect, where everyone feels safe, valued, and empowered to just be themselves. And I think that's a beautiful segue into our final reflections of, you know, this deep dive. Mm -hmm. We've explored the impact of trauma. We've, you know, looked at all the different ways that it can shape personality. Mm -hmm. But I think we also need to acknowledge the incredible strength and resilience of autistic individuals. Yeah, absolutely. You know, despite facing so many challenges, so many autistic people not only survive, but they thrive. Yeah. And they make significant contributions to their communities and to the world. You know, they really enrich our lives in countless ways. Their unique perspectives and talents and insights are invaluable. And so as we wrap up this deep dive, yeah. you know, I encourage you to celebrate the diversity, the creativity, and the resilience of this incredible community. Let's move beyond seeing trauma as like a defining characteristic yeah. and instead focus on that potential for healing for growth and for empowerment. Because even in the face of adversity, there is hope. There is strength. Yeah. And there's the power to create a better future, you know, for, for ourselves and for future generations. Beautifully said. I think that's the perfect note to end this part of our conversation on. It feels like we've gone like so deep on this topic, but I also feel like we've only just scratched the surface. Like, I feel like we could do a whole series on this, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's always more to learn, more to explore, more ways to deepen our understanding and our compassion. And speaking of exploring, I kind of wanted to circle back to something that you said earlier about the importance of remembering the individual behind the personality the child behind the behavior. I think that's so powerful. It is. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in labels and diagnoses. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're talking about real people. Yeah. With real lives. Yeah. And the very real impact that trauma can have on them. Yeah. It's like we can talk about the hypervigilant protector or the angry reactor, you yeah. know, as these like concepts. But those are just words. They're just frameworks to help us understand. 
But the real story is in the individual. It's in their unique experience and how they respond to the world. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to approach each person with a sense of curiosity, you know, with a willingness to really listen to their story, to understand their perspective, mm. and to try to see the world through their eyes, even if it's different from our own. Right. It's about meeting them where they are, not where we expect them to be, and just validating their experiences, even if we don't fully understand them. Absolutely. And that brings us back to, you know, the heart of this whole deep dive which is creating a more trauma-informed society. And that's not just about changing policies or systems. It's about changing how we interact with each other, how we see each other, how we value each other. So as we wrap up, like, what's one key takeaway that you hope our listeners walk away with today? Hmm, that's a good question. If I had to pick one, I think it would be this. Trauma is not a sign of weakness. It's a testament to the human capacity to endure. And you know the way in which someone responds to trauma whether it's through hypervigilance or withdrawal, anger, compliance, resilience, it's not a reflection of their character, right. but it's a reflection of their experiences right. and the coping mechanisms that they've had to develop to navigate a world that hasn't always felt safe for understanding. Wow. That's so well said. And it really reminds me that even in the face of adversity, there is hope, there is strength, and there's always potential for healing, for growth, and for connection. Exactly. And I, I think it's our responsibility as individuals and as a society to really foster an environment where that healing and growth can flourish, to create spaces where autistic individuals feel safe and supported yeah. and empowered to be their authentic selves. Yes. It's about shifting our focus, you know, away from fixing or changing autistic people and towards understanding and accepting them for who they are uh, and giving them the tools and resources that they need to thrive. Absolutely. Let's celebrate their neurodiversity honor their strengths and their challenges yep. and work together to build a world that truly embraces, you know, the full spectrum of human experience. I love that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with us today. This has been such a thought provoking conversation. And I know I'm going to be thinking about these things, you know, long after we finish recording. The pleasure was all mine. It's always so inspiring to connect with people who are, yeah. you know, passionate about this. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us for this deep dive. We hope this episode has sparked your curiosity and maybe even challenged some of your assumptions <laughs> and that you feel inspired to, you know, continue learning and advocating for a world where everyone feels seen, heard, and valued. Until next time, keep diving deep. It's